Hey there chemists, welcome to today's lesson. Uh, today we're gonna be talking a little bit about what is called colligative properties. It is our last lesson of the solutions unit and it is one of my favorite. And so I thought we could start today's lesson with just a quick YouTube video. So let's go ahead and take a look. All right, so I want to pause there because I don't want to give too much away here. But as many of you guys may be familiar, we uh, often salt the roads in winter, okay, or salt the sidewalks. You know, having to walk everywhere in New York City, you probably understand that, right? It is really dangerous and it's really important to get that salt out. But the question is why and how does this work? So what we're going to do today is we're going to uh, talk about why do we salt the roads during winter? okay or the sidewalks uh now let's go ahead and i wanted to see if i could expand the size of my screen but i guess it's not going to let me because i already started recording that's okay so what i want to do first is i just want us to look again at this heating curve of water throwing it back to our last uh unit with heat and talking about um the different phases of water so uh we have here our heating curve of water and as they mentioned in the video right we have two well, we have really one important temperature that we're talking about at least in terms of salting roads but two important temperatures to talk about on this heating curve so the first is our zero degree mark again this is going to be point b this is going to be our melting point of water and it typically melts at zero degrees celsius okay um, and then we also have point C, um, or I'm sorry, point D, and this is going to be the boiling point of water. And again, that typically happens at 100 degrees Celsius, okay? Again, just really quickly so that we have it on there, A is where we have solid, okay? B is when we have the solid to liquid phase change, C is when we see a liquid, D is the liquid to gas phase change, and E is our gas uh in is our phase of gas okay so again this is our general heating curve of water this is under regular standard conditions so i want to focus first today on letter point b and focusing a little bit about the interaction that occurs um, between two water molecules in order to form a solid um, and and really those intermolecular forces so let's start here by first go, going ahead and drawing our two liquid or our two water molecules and talking a little bit about how they interact. So we have here, okay, our first H2O molecule. Again, if you are not comfortable with drawing molecules, I definitely recommend going back and rewatching some of the covalent bonding. This is definitely a skill that we're going to use a lot moving forward. Um, and then we have our second water molecule. So we have these two water molecules, they coexist, and I want to know what is the interaction or rather attraction that exists between these two molecules. Now, in order to investigate that attraction, again, we have to look at our partial positives and partial negatives that are formed uh, due to the molecular polarity. Okay, or due to the, that electronegativity difference. So in order to label our partial positives and partial negatives, remember the partial negative is assigned to the more electronegative element, okay? So we have H, which is a 2.2, O, which is in its threes. I can't, I should have looked it up. I believe it's a 3.4, but I, I could be wrong off the top of my head. Um, and so I need to go ahead and label those as partial positive and partial negative. H is less electronegative, so it is assigned our partial positive charges. 
and O is our partial negative charge on both accounts, okay? Same occurs on the other water molecule, partial positives and partial negative. So now that I have all of these labeled, we can start to talk a little bit about the attraction that exists between these two molecules. So in, if you think about back to ionic compounds, a positive and a negative attract, okay? So the same is true when we're talking about covalent and when we're talking about those uh, intermolecular forces, the partial positives and the partial negatives attract one another. Remember to draw our intermolecular force of attraction, we use that dotted line to represent the attractive force. And I'll just go ahead and label that again here. So this is the attractive force. And let's go ahead and jot down uh, this in, in word format. So the partial positive of the H K atom is attracted to the partial negative of the O atom. And again, this is intermolecular forces, but more specifically, since we're talking about an H that's bonded to an F, an H that's bonded to an O, or an H that's bonded to an N, this is hydrogen bonding. Okay? Now, in order for water to form a solid, in order for that ice to form, okay, we need the water molecules to be able to attract to one another, to be able to form these intermolecular forces of attraction. And so I do also want to go ahead and jot that down. So in order for a solid to form, okay, H2O must be able to attract to the other H2O. So when we typically have ice that forms, there's nothing really getting in the way of that. The H2O is able to attract the H2O and it forms the solid. But what happens when we add salt to that, to that water, okay, or to that ice? So let's go ahead and draw the, the interaction or the attraction that occurs between water and NaCl. So I wanna go ahead and sketch out my water molecule again. So we have H2O. Okay, and we have our sodium and our chloride, which again is made from just a positive and negative ion that were bonded together. But when they're placed into water, remember that those ions break apart and they become attracted to the partial positives and partial negatives. So actually, let's go ahead and label those partial positives and partial negatives again. So partial positives and our partial negative. Okay, great. So now we drop our sodium chloride in. So which ion is going to be attracted to the hydrogen side of the water? Okay, and that's gonna be our chloride ion, the Cl minus ion, okay? The negative attracts the partial positive, et cetera. And our sodium Na plus ion is attracted to the partial, uh, the partial negative. So let's go ahead and put that in words, okay? Our uh, Na plus ion is attracted to the partial negative of the water, okay? And the chloride ion is attracted to the partial positive of the water, okay? Or the hydrogen, okay? Um, this is specifically called molecule ion attraction and it's called that because it's a water molecule attracted to mobile ions okay this term does pop up in questions on the region so you should make note that this is an important term to know okay now just to prove a point here if i were to drop another water molecule in okay right here we go we have our other water molecule here What's the problem? Is the water molecule able to form 
you need active force with the other water molecule. Well, not really, not in, not as easily anyways, right? This sodium is in the way of this hydrogen, right? The sodium is in the way of the hydrogen. They're going to bump, okay, kind of, uh, kind of heads here. They both positively charge the O's attracted to the Na. And in fact, this is a full positive charge versus that partial positive charge of the H. So the point that I want to make and the reason that this impacts the, free, the ability of water to freeze, okay, right? Because in the video we said we salt the roads to keep the water from freezing. The reason it, it uh, impacts the ability of the water to freeze is because of that interruption because of the sodium chloride. So the positive ion attraction, right, that Na plus ion, okay, is stronger than the partial positive attraction. And therefore, Okay, interrupts the two H2O molecules attraction. Okay, and what this does is it lowers the freezing point of the water. And so what does that mean to lower the freezing point? Well, that means instead of water freezing at 32 degrees Celsius, or 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius, it's actually going to um, freeze at a lower temperature. So when we salt the roads, what we're doing is we're prepping for those temperatures to drop. And if those temperatures stay within a specific range, then the ice should not be able to form over that salt. So cool. Um, so that lowers the freezing point, and this is called freezing point depression, okay? And this is our first example of a colligative property that we're looking at. So again, this is a colligative property, okay? And the freezing point depression is any addition of solute lowers the freezing point of a pure solvent, okay? So what this means is that, again, pure H2O freezes at zero degrees Celsius. If I have any sort of solution, anytime I add a solute to that water, it now lowers the freezing point of that water. Um, I want to say that our road salt that we use uh, is effective up until about uh, 15 degrees Fahrenheit. If it drops below that, it, it honestly doesn't impact it. The water is still going to freeze, even if there's salt there. All right, so that's our freezing point depression. That's the first of the two colligative properties. The next one that I want to talk about is what is called boiling point elevation. Now, I'm not going to make us go through and draw out all those diagrams again. Obviously, you now see that if there's a solute added to the solution, that it's going to uh, it's going to impact the ability of the water to either freeze or, in this case, boil. Um, but the boiling is a little bit different, and so I do want to kind of just quickly talk about that. If you think back to what we learned about boiling, okay? The process of boiling is the uh, water molecules, and uh, if you want to just pay attention to this and not sketch this, that's totally fine on your notes, but the ability of, of something to boil is these two water molecules breaking their attractive forces, right? In order to, in order to boil, they have to separate from one another. So boiling is the separation of H2O molecules. So when you boil something, those two molecules separate. So how does adding solute to a solution impact the ability of something to boil? Well, if you think about what we just said, the positive and negative ions in solution, okay, have a strong attraction 
okay, to the H2O molecules. And so that's actually going to keep those water molecules from leaving to boil. Okay, it's going to hold those water molecules in solution. Okay, so the positive and negative ions in solution have strong attractions to the water molecules um, and hold. the molecules in solution longer, okay? So what ends up happening is that in order to get water to boil, if there is salt or if there is anything in that water, in order to get it to boil, it needs more energy to have that water pull away from those ions. And so what it does is it actually increases the boiling point, okay? And so our second colligative property that we're interested in is called boiling point elevation, okay? And boiling point elevation is, again, any addition of solutes to, uh, to uh, solvents increases the boiling point, okay, of pure solvent. Um, and so I like to think of this, at, like in order to keep it straight in my mind, the high gets high and the low gets low, okay? The freezing point goes down, the boiling point goes up. It expands the amount of time that our substance exists in the liquid phase, okay? So if I walked outside onto my balcony that I have here, and I decided to put down table salt onto the ice, would that be effective in getting rid of the ice? Well, there's actually better types of salt to use for our sidewalks and our roads rather than just the sodium chloride that we use in the kitchen. And so the question is why? Why is that the case? What's different about the different types of salts? Well, the greater the concentration of dissolved ions, the greater the impact on our freezing point, the lower the freezing point can get or the higher the boiling point can get. So let's take a look at three examples and we'll talk about which will have the greatest impact on our uh, boiling point or freezing point. So the first thing I wanna, the first solute I wanna talk about, let's say I decided to add one mole of NaCl into onto the ice okay versus one mole of CaCl2 versus one mole of sugar C12H22O11 okay so notice in the statement here the greater the concentration of dissolved ions the greater the impact on the freezing point and boiling point and so we need to take a look here at how many ions will there be in our solution once we've added that. So the first thing that we always need to do here is analyze, is our solute ionic or is it covalent, okay? So in this first, sodium chloride, metal, non-metal is ionic. Calcium chloride, metal, non-metal, it's ionic. And then lastly, glue, or I'm sorry, sucrose or table sugar, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen are all nonmetals, so it's covalent. The reason this is important is because remember, when ionic substances dissolve, they break apart into mobile ions. When covalent substances are dissolved, they do not separate into ions. Okay, so when we dissolve these solutes, then how many ions do I end up with? And I know this is kind of weird to think about it this way, but remember, NaCl looks like this. So if I separate it, if I have one mole of sodium chloride, that means I end up with one mole of Na ions or Na plus ions, and I end up with one mole of Cl minus ions. This is gonna give me a total of two moles of ions. Okay, now in our next one, CaCl2, it has one positive, but two negatives. So when it dissolves, it creates 
one mole of Ca2 plus ions and two moles okay, of Cl minus ions, okay? And then lastly, again, we have our covalent substance. Well, again, note this does not separate into ions. So how does that then impact its concentration? Well, we need to look at the total number of particles now that exist in solution. So in this solution, I have one and two moles of particles, okay? In our second solution, I have one, two, three moles of particles. And in our last solution that does not break apart into ions, I only have one mole of particles, okay? So which of these is going to have the greatest impact on our solute, okay, or on our freezing point and boiling point? Okay, the answer is the one with the greatest concentration. So the one that's gonna have the greatest impact is our calcium chloride, okay? So this has the, the most concentrated when dissolved, okay? Therefore, this has the higher boiling point and lower freezing points, okay? I apologize for the length of this video. I know it's long, but this is a kind of complex subject. Um, so thank you guys for tuning in, and we will practice this on Monday, and I will see you guys tomorrow. Have a good day.